of producers, consumers, and technology providers across the entire biofuel energy value chain, government officials, and others. Through the course of the two sessions, you will hear on the importance of biofuels as a low carbon pathway to development, its importance across the entire socioeconomic de development value chain, and how it has been tied in to ensure that a country can meet its energy security needs, as well as transitioning to a low carbon pathway. Access to reliable, sustainable, and affordable energy is the cornerstone of any energy policy. This is the realization amongst all countries, be them developing or development, or developed. At the same time, there is a recognition that there's a need to ensure environmental conscious development, as well as ensuring that the future, the needs of the future generation are taken care of. Green growth has been part of our traditional eth ethos and our cultural fabric. The importance of green growth only continues unabated. In the recent, recently announced budget, green growth was highlighted as one of the seven main priorities for the government. In this context, biofuel emerges as a critical pathway for the decarbonization. It provides easier and accessible use for the develop and, and a compelling proposition for both developed and developing countries. It ensures exp expedited energy transition while balancing energy security redu em emission reductions while other in, in this backdrop, while other low carbon pathways may have some challenges, biofuels positions itself as a mature drop in technology which can be used. India itself is a case study in this point. In a short period of eight years, we've ramped up our blending rate from about 1.5% to 10%, five, uh, five months before our targeted day. We've also begun the rollout of E20 three in 11 states, three months prior to our targets. We've also advanced the dates of achieving E20 from ESY, that's ethanol supplier 2030 to 2025. So what does the India story showcase? It showcases the ability of biofuels to be used with less infrastructure ability, infrastructure changes, shows its ability as a drop in fuel, shows how mature technology is, and shows an example for countries to ramp up its use. Furthermore, through lowering GHG emissions, reducing import dependency, and boosting en energy security, and enabling circularity, it provides a whole bouquet and a range of solutions, not only in terms of energy push, but in terms of downstream applications, through, lig through valorization of lignocellulosic products, through biochemicals and po polymers, it provides solution across the entire energy value chain. In some cases, it is presented as the only option, as the only solution for decarbonizing hard to abate sectors. The best case in point would be the aviation sector. Also more importantly, as countries further develop, further urbanize, it provides a unique solutions of repurposing wastes, be it agricultural residue, municipal solid waste, uh, used cooking oils, and convert them towards more beneficial and useful products, highlighting and underscoring the purpose, I mean, the, the, the sense of reuse, recycle, and repurpose. Through our journey, we have successfully been able to bring benefits of reduced carbon emissions, reduced for, uh, 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 forex savings, as well as increased farmer's income. As we ramp up to, to, to E20, these benefits are only bound to increase. Friends, during the G20, we are also neg uh, negotiating for a global biofuel alliance, which underscores the need for greater cooperation and collaboration amongst countries, which focuses on development and deployment of these technologies and brings in within this fold countries beyond the G20. While we are planning to launch this soon, I welcome you all to be integral, integral parts of it so that we can 
through a whole of government and all of industry approach, work towards ensuring a proper future for the entire, for the entire global citizens. With these opening remarks, uh, I take the opportunity to invite Deepankar Jain, Secretary, Ministry of Petroleum and Natural Gas, for the keynote address. Sir, over to you. Mr. Vedya, Mr. Krishna Kumar, uh, all of from IEA and uh, from Praj, Mr. Shishir, HPCL team B, and uh, all my colleagues and friends. It's an absolute pleasure to be here and talk about a subject on which not only is it close to my heart, but it's also something where success has actually been visible to us as citizens. Success has also been visible to us in terms of what it has meant for farmers' incomes, what it has meant for the economy as a whole. And uh, last night, in fact, we were discussing this uh, last evening, uh, this whole thing which George just mentioned about the Global Biofuels Alliance. And what struck me is how it resonates across the whole idea of biofuels, how it resonates across very different economies, very different countries, very different contexts. Because it is not just about decarbonization. The entire biofuel space has moved to something which means so much more in terms of economics, so much more in terms of prosperity, and really helps us address some of the core questions which keep coming up around the energy trilemma, around access, around affordability of energy, and again, about sustainability of energy, and while at the same time, it helps in the transition towards uh, a greener and a cleaner fuel which, um, uh, which powers mobility, which uh, which, uh, which uh, powers industry. So all those really have, have done a, a lot of things in terms of making it possible. Also the beauty as it kept coming across is that there are multiple pathways to biofuels. It is never about only one way of doing biofuels and it's a technology which has become quite mature over the years. So whether it is biofuels coming out of um, sugarcane, biofuels coming out of corn, or biofuels coming out of uh, agriculture waste or bamboo, there is comfort which we can draw from the fact that there is maturity of technology. And that gives confidence to entrepreneurs, confidence to investors that yes, I think I can do it on scale. And I think I can make money by doing it on scale and I can drive process improvements, I can do, I can make this thing even more efficient. And I must compliment, you know, people like Praj have done a great work in that in terms of making technology accessible. Our oil marketing companies have, uh, in fact, uh, the way they have gone completely backstopping the entire procurement of biofuels, which enables advanced planning. That itself has made sure that entrepreneurs are now able to take the risk, invest, and banks are able to lend. So in a sense, the ecosystem which got built here in the last few years, after a series of false starts, gives us the confidence that we can actually take a much bigger leap in the next three years. And if we, if we can actually start planning for what, what all we'll be doing for the next three years, what we'll be delivering, and how do we spread the biofuel revolution into other areas of the country and also into other fuels. Up until now, in India, biofuels meant ethanol and petrol. That, ladies and gentlemen, is changing. So if we are going to look at SAF, we are going to look at uh, alcohol to jet, we are going to look at oil to jet, we are looking at biodiesel, we are uh, compressed biogas is probably the next big thing compressed biogas aligned to ethanol production. We are also looking at renewable DME. So suddenly you find that, A, you need to start learning new abbreviations <laughs> and also start getting more familiar with newer molecules. So, so that is, is really what is very exciting to be in this space. And so, I mean, IEA is here. In fact, just if you look at some of the numbers which IEA itself has put out, I mean, their expectation is that in the next seven years, there's almost going to be a 4x jump 
in biofuels production worldwide. Now that, that, that to my mind is a huge, huge business opportunity. I just need to be able to make sure that I'm not just over time producing for the domestic market, but there is a much wider market waiting for me to pick this up. Uh, look at it another way, the, the way, the why a global biofuel alliance started making sense. When India uh, looked at this in 2014, when we looked at this seriously, we actually drew inspiration from Brazil. And I have no hesitation admitting this, that we saw Brazil and we, we, we thought that, look, it can be done. We're, we're obviously not taking the right steps, we're not doing the right things, and that's why we're not succeeding. And I think repeatedly we have interacted with Brazil. We have learned a lot from them. We have learned from Unica. We have learned from their automobile manufacturers. From a whole lot of people we learned. And today, we, uh, if we are at 12% this year and 20% in the next two years, we now have other countries looking both at India and Brazil. Even as Brazil moves ahead, Brazil will look at, you know, they have E27 as base fuel. They will move to E30. So all, all that's something is which we keenly track. We see that, uh, you know, it, how things are possible, and if they don't do it in two wheelers, we'll do it in two wheelers. So we, we become leaders in terms of what can be done. Uh, we look at Indonesia, what they are doing on biodiesel, for instance, that excites us, that yes, there is something which we could do. And uh, in some of the other products, we will be taking the lead, and you know people can come in and start understanding, for example, the kind of work which is happening right now on 2G ethanol, and I think we'll soon run out of numbers, uh, 3G ethanol and 4G, because uh, IOC is here, they're already talking to me that uh, of a demo plan for 3G ethanol. So, so they're, they, these, are, uh, these are actually uh, not just interesting times, they're actually very exciting times to, to, to be in and, uh, and work on this. In fact, in so many ways, the numbers also add up in uh, phenomenally. Just for India alone, we were looking at uh, some of the numbers in the last eight years, our foreign exchange saving has been about USD eight billion. So eight billion dollars is what we have saved. Uh, almost five billion actually has gone to our farmers. So, and more importantly, it has helped solve one of the perennial problems of the sugar industry. Sugar industry for a very long time, I, I remember from my early days as, as a child, Sugar industry has had cycles of boom and bust. It was almost like clockwork. You could predict that in three years, four years, there's going to be distress in the sugar industry. Now, how is it in the last eight to 10 years we've stopped hearing that narrative? It's obviously some de-risking has happened. So the collateral benefits of biofuels have been far, far more than what is often given credit for. And that is why we have put our whole heft behind this. We think that today, when we talk of 2G ethanol, we're talking about some 200,000 tons of rice straw, paddy straw being used productively, generating almost 30 million liters of ethanol. We will see off gases being used for again for generation of ethanol. It becomes a way to produce methanol and then look at uh, blending in diesel. So what you see going in your car, you probably won't realize it. But increasingly, what is going into your car, into the internal combustion engine, is not going to be a fossil fuel. It's going to be effectively, steadily be replaced by something which is sustainable, something which is greener, but something which will not mean that overnight we fall off a cliff. It is going to be gradual, it's going to be steady, but it is going to be predictable and it's going to be certain. And therefore that is the promise which this entire endeavor of the Global Biofuel Alliance holds, not just for India, but for the countries which are participating in the G20, but also for countries which are not part of the G20. E improvement of yields, newer crops, and the, the, the question itself has to be reframed. It's no longer going to be about food crops versus fuel crops. It's going to be food and fuel coming from the same crop. Is that possible? I think biofuels shows the way that it can be done. And that is why we think that this initiative is something which will deliver 
a lot of results, deliver something, a lot of positivity, and make a tangible difference to people's life. So I, I, I thought that in that way, the seminar is particularly timely, and uh, so that we can share perspectives, we can sensitize people, we can create more awareness about what's happening, and uh, it's, it's, uh, therefore it's, it's wonderful to be here and, and uh, be able to interact with all of you and, and take this journey forward. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, if I could take two words from those, confidence, excitement. Confidence that India will be able to take it forward and excitement that India is taking it forward. Uh, the next speaker embodies those two traits. Uh, may I invite Chairman IOCL to share his thoughts with us. Uh, IOCL has been one of the forefronts in the biofuel sector. They're working on 2G, they're working on refinery of gases. And now here's the Chairman to take you through those. Watch out. These are exciting times. <laughs> Secretary Petroleum and all the distinguished members on the dais, my senior colleagues from the oil industry in the audience, ladies and gentlemen, in the ever-evolving business landscape, only a few business ecosystems are as volatile and vibrant as the global energy sector today, where we witness dynamic chapters being scripted regularly. The primary energy demand of India is projected to grow at a staggering 2.2% annually, significantly higher than the global average of 0.2% until 2050. It is expected to account for around 14% of the global primary energy consumption in 2050, with a 60% share of renewables, including biofuels. The spiraling energy appetite of the world's most populous country, representing a fifth of the global population, combined with India's resolve to achieve energy independence by 2047 and net zero emissions by 2070, makes India's energy sector the epicenter of global energy discourse. It is estimated that by 2070, 90 million metric tons of biofuels will be produced from the current 5 million metric tons per annum. Biofuels play a very prominent role in the net zero strategies as a clean energy source, which can be utilized directly or blended with fuels or further to earn carbon credits. In the Indian context, production of biofuels is in alignment to synergize with the Atmanirbhar Bharat, Swachh Bharat mission, climate change mission, and the COP26 commitments. Indian oil is tapping opportunities in the entire gamut of biofuels, such as ethanol, biodiesel, compressed biogas, biobitumen, apart from the opportunities in sustainable aviation fuel. In fact, we have already announced investment approval for 87,000 tons per annum of SAF at Panipat. And as far as 2G is concerned, our plant is already commissioned. We are producing ethanol from the Parali that is produced in the nearby areas of Karnal and Panipat in Haryana. And as far as 3G is concerned, that is from the refinery waste gases, we are already started. The plant is already commissioned and producing. So I think this is, as Secretary was saying, very, very exciting times. And these small, small incremental changes will eventually lead to a big change over a period of time. In fact, after the early achievement of the E10 blending target in June last year, the oil marketing companies have already begun introduction of E20, uh, blended petrol at select retail outlets in line with the national target of 20% blending by 2025. While the benefits of biofuels in terms of environmental sustainability and rural economic prosperity, apart from the greater energy independence are undisputed, what we need is strengthening of the entire biofuel ecosystem for an affordable and sustained presence. Creation of mechanism for steady supply of biomass feedstocks at competitive rates through long-term contracts and also encouraging offtake of the fermented organic manure by fertilizer companies will go a long way in ensuring the viability of the biofuels plant. I must say that a new energy economy is on the horizon, and India is at the forefront 
ushering in forward with the policy action, technology innovation, and increasing urgency. Achieving the Panchamrit and net zero goals requires a collaborative, environmentally sustainable, and responsive actions by all for decoupling energy growth from greenhouse gas emissions, a strategic balance that echoes India's G20 presidency theme as a just and sustainable future for all in this world. Let me assert that it is time for us to take a proactive role in shaping the energy industry's future by making India a powerhouse in the biofuels and the allied sector. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. India has always believed that India can contribute to the global commons, to the global world. And through this, we have actually had discussions with multiple international organizations. A key amongst them is the International Energy Agency. And we have with us Mr. Paulo, who's head of the Renewable Energy Divisions in the IEA, with whom we are actively engaging to take the biofuel solutions, the unique biofuel mechanisms in India, and how we can collaborate on it with the global community, with the global industry, for the benefit of the global world. Secretary Jane, uh, George Thomas, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's a real pleasure to represent the IA. Thank you very much for inviting us at this important event. I would like to make three short points in my intervention. Uh, the first is the need for acceleration. And I would like to quote your words, Secretary Jane, we need the biofuel revolution. The benefits of biofuels are, have been visible and biofuels have been growing steadily, but not fast enough. According to the IEA net zero scenario, by 2030, demand and production of sustainable biofuels need to increase by more than a factor three. And the uh, shares of biofuels in transport demand would grow from 4% today to 12% by 2030 with enormous benefits in terms of energy security. Now, biofuel demand expands in all transport segments, in, in hard to decarbonize sectors like trucks, aviation and shipping, and aviation has been men mentioned in particular, but I would like also to underline that passenger vehicle biofuel also expands even with significant electric vehicle deployment in parallel because of the big benefits of biofuels as drop-in fuels that can uh, uh, lower emissions of gasoline and diesel cars which are already on the road. In terms of technology, it has been mentioned we will need both advanced and conventional biofuel supplies. Advanced fuels made from materials that don't compete with food, and as you said, we will have food and uh, uh, fuels together, but I wish also to underline that sustainable biofuels produced from conventional crops, especially for ethanol, will have to room to expand on 30 by 2030. My second point is the investment opportunity, in particular for emerging economies. According to our data, two-thirds of the investments will have to occur in emerging economies, up to $50 billion in the biofuels. And investments bring benefits as employment opportunities, especially in rural communities, as it was also mentioned by Secretary Jane before. However, one point which I would like to stress is that this does not come on its own. It requires dedicated strategies and consistent policies and this is my third point. We have good examples in the world, and everybody goes back to Brazil, starting uh, on this. Indeed, Brazil, followed by United States, and more recently in India, all demonstrate how you can drive biofuel production growth at scale. These countries have used a package of policies, including blending requirements, standards, requirements on emission, and financial incentives to promote use in a, within a long-term strategy. And more recently, India has used a similar mix of policies to accelerate biofuel demand and domestic production with really impressive results in the field of ethanol, but I'm totally with you when I hear this needs to expand to other uses of biofuels, and that is the next. 
And so, to conclude, I wish to say that the IA really praises India to taking the leadership in raising the awareness and the importance of biofuels at the attention of G20 countries and beyond. The IA supports the development of the Global Biofuel Alliance that, in our view, can help in four respects, in particular, to this uh, acceleration. First, focus on developing new markets with, an, um, with a particular eye on emerging economies. Second, raising awareness of the biofuel benefits, sharing lessons learned on policies and also existing standards and certifications, and ensure from the very beginning that fuels are sustainable, secure and affordable, and avoiding this uh, long-standing discussion of controversy between fuel and fuels. And last but certainly not least, also working in collaboration with the many existing initiatives. The IA stands ready to support the Global Biofuel Alliance directly and also, of course, in collaboration with existing initiatives where we are involved, notably the Biofuture Platform Initiative under the Clean Energy Ministerial and Mission Innovation and the IEA Bioenergy Technology Collaboration Program. I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Polo. In our discussions, one key aspect which has come out is that if India is now raising it, then it can be done globally. If India is on board, we can achieve it. And this has been a resounding theme which has come out through all our discussions and through, and through what we've heard today. Now may I invite another chairman of an oil company. You may ask us why so many oil companies. It's because now they have been taking the lead in, a in the entire low carbon pathway to development especially biofuels. May I now invite Mr. Krishna, G. Krishna Kumar on stage to share his thoughts with us on what his company is doing to spearhead the biofuel revolution. Good morning. It gives me immense pleasure to be in this August gathering today. Secretary Mr. Jain, Chairman Mr. Vaidya, other distinguished members on the stage, Chairman HPCL, Mr. Pushup Joshi, and other senior colleagues of mine. The case for biodiesel is very well established. That the fact that we have to accelerate is also very well established now. Given the context of growing energy needs of India, which is supposed to rise the highest in the, uh, in the last 10 years, and in the going years, we need to now also balance this with sustainability. And the biofuel will play a key role in this aspect. And if we were to do uh, the way we have been doing, will not be enough. We need to accelerate. Let's take the case in point of how we have achieved tremendous success so far. We started off with the introduction of E10, which we said we will do it. We completed it in June of 22, much ahead of schedule. The E12 was introduced in December of 22, again much ahead of schedule, and E20 was introduced in 23 February, five years before schedule, and we expect to roll out by 25 across the country. What does this gain? Like Secretary said, we're going to save about $8 billion of foreign exchange and more so in carbon emission reductions. If, for example, a case in point, if you add one crore little of ethanol at 10% blending rate, it's supposed to save us 20,000 tons of carbon oxide emissions. If this is the kind of benefit the country is going to get, what else can we drive from? The pillars on which the biofuel will rest is on energy security, energy uh, <laughs> greenhouse gas reductions, and also the main point being our rural infrastructure development. It will generate rural economy, it will generate employment, and it will also give ways to wealth creations. How did we go about doing this? The, the government very well supported us, supported us and the oil companies by introducing the national biopolicy, which encouraged the use of biofuels. They also encouraged uh, multiple uh, mandates were given. For example, ethanol blending programs were introduced. Biodiesel blending of 5% was mandated. And also where the, this was not being used, penalty was also introduced. The carrot and stick policy was used to encourage it. 
But so that there were two prong strategy which the government adopted. One was demand creation and the other was the supply side uh, issues being taken care of. In the demand side creation, very clearly mandates worked and the introduction timelines which were specified worked very well. While in the case of the supply side, there were three prong challenges which we faced. One, investment was not forthcoming as required. That was supported very well by the interest subvention schemes which were introduced, which encouraged many, many entrepreneurs to invest in these scales. In the second one was the procurement cycle. The first part was done was that the ethanol, which was given at administered pricing, so it was very remunerative and it was encouraging for entrepreneurs to do it. The second part of it was the movement of ethanol across the states were freed with necessary amendments. And the third part of it was the reduction of GST rates from 18% to 5%, which also stimulated demand and ease of doing business through vendor registration through all the oil companies were done. Offtakes were promised, so there was a guarantee of offtake. So that also encouraged stimulation. Feedback, feedstock challenges were also overcome through broad basing the feedstocks from sugar, sugar cane, sugar syrup, it went up to uh, maize, and also even tapioca was introduced in many places. Use cooking oil for biodiesel uh, for ethanol production, uh, press mud and spent wa uh, wash for CBG, and promoting less water intensive crops like maize, which helped to carry fuel. But one of the main points which we introduced was we avoided burning fuel to carry, reach these fuel. In the sense, we put up plants at the locations where it was required. Wherever there is deficit state also, we are going to introduce these plants shortly. To solve the food fuel versus fuel deplet, technology was used. The yield per hectare has been enhanced at the producer's end and also at the farmer's end to, the, to fill up the needs. So I think finally, to conclude, this acceleration can only happen if there is a clear vision, a holistic supply and demand management, and continuous improvement in the technology. And I think in the years to come, biofuel will remain to stay. Thank you very much. As has been highlighted, continuous development of technology is a key necessity to ensure greater efficiencies and greater returns. May I now invite Mr. Shashir Joshipura from Praj Industries, of unique technology providers in this initiative, who's taken India's success stories globally and who has partnered with more than 100 countries to ensure these benefits, which I mentioned earlier, better efficiencies, are taken not only in India but across the globe. May I please invite you to share your comments with us? <clears throat> Good morning. Uh, thank you, George. Uh, Mr. Jain, uh, distinguished guest on the panel, my co-warriors in the green uh, energy arena. <clears throat> George is a very good friend of mine, as you would have guessed. I'm the last speaker after so many distinguished ones. So I was making notes, and then I was cutting it, saying, oh, Mr. Jain said this, Ms. Vedya said this, Ms. Krishna said this, and Paolo took the. So what's left? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> no, on the light side. But <clears throat> what's, what's, what we've seen from the industry is two very, very uh, important. The National Biofuel Policy in 2018, which set this bold vision uh, and which then further got accelerated around E20 program uh, on the ethanol side, which probably in many ways heralded the revolution of uh, biofuels in the country. And that was immediately followed by what I be personally believe to be a very innovative program called Satat, which pushed the CBG uh, on the forefront. These two put together have actually propelled the whole cause of bioenergy onto a very, very different platform. <clears throat> and when we were thinking, we said, these two, what's the problem that we are trying to solve? These two are very, very important two wheels. Uh, and very clearly, uh, the answer is that we're all trying to decarbonize the energy and create a sustainable future. If this is the issue, that we're trying to decarbonize energy, then can we be limited to just two? or we need to expand, as was being said, that the canvas of 
sustainable energy is really unfolding in a very, very, every alternate day. Uh, I scratch my head and say, oh, this is something new. Do we need to do this? So, so we said, how do we go about looking at this? And we said, all right, let's call this whole phenomena uh, a phenomena of biomobility. So we said, that probably captures the whole uh, sort of platform onto one thing to do. And so then mobility is whether it's on surface, whether it's on air, whether it is marine. That's a big, big way to look at uh, a very sustainable way of driving the technology development as well. Our uh, friendship, our collaboration, our association with the three leading OMCs in the country is something that we are very proud of. Uh, without their support, we wouldn't be here today. Uh, and I really want to thank you because it takes a lot to believe, uh, especially uh, when we're talking about a technology that is no precedence before it. Uh, moving forward, uh, obviously, very clearly, uh, uh, Ms. Jen mentioned, Mr. Vedde also said, uh, there's a big move now about this food versus fuel program, et cetera, et cetera. And I think a very powerful slogan, uh, which we have all heard, and I'll say this the way it is said and then translate it to English for my friends who are not, who don't know Hindi. Uh, so we said that the Anna Data is going to become Urja Data. And that meant that a farmer who gave me food will also become the person who gives me energy. That's what it literally translates to. So if we are going to get that much bolder vision, uh, I think a lot of good is on its way because now, and in my 40 years at least, I have not seen a program that actually connects a rural part of economy to an urban industrialized world so, so powerfully with so many co-benefits. As the role of technology evolves and drives and meets the new challenges, we, we are also realizing that it's no longer a one feedstock and one product game. We are now looking at multiple feedstocks and multiple products. Uh, Mr. Vaidya mentioned that it's not about ethanol, 2G, 1G, 3G, those are the terms that we coined, but more important around it is what core products of biobitumin do we make roads uh, which are more sustainable and we start to think, oh, we never thought like that. But maybe it's possible to create road that's much more uh, sustainable. It's possible to create a fuel for rural applications that completely replaces the so-called unhygienic conditions under which rural women and folk actually go around cooking every day. In many ways, uh, biofuels have a big, big role to play in decarbonizing the future. There are many issues that needs to get resolved, whether, and I will just illustrate a few, uh, e-mobility, or flex fuel, right? Do we want to go this way or that way? And I think we have to learn to evolve into an ecosystem which says it's not necessarily an or game. It can also be an end game. So there is a space for every solution given a context. For a company which is, for a country like India, which is agrarian in nature, very clearly biofuels have a very, very large role to play because that connects uh, Ms. Chen mentioned about sugar sector being a stress sector a decade ago, and now nobody talks about it. And biofuels have played a big transformational role. The leadership of sugar industry has also provided that impetus. And at least in our vision, we, don't, we, we see sugar to be a byproduct in near future from sugar companies. Because they, as they evolve from sugar to power to biofuels, we see a completely different space taking place where they actually become, they start with a feedstock and actually become a refinery of sorts. So future is full of excitement. There are definitive technological plays uh, that will have to come uh, and address the situation. But we just have to remember one thing, at the end of the day, the race is to decarbonize the future and we are committed to make that happen. Thank you so much. Thank you for those comments. Uh, they say we save the best for the last. Uh, so with that, while the speakers in the panel are finished, that is not the end to this program. We have some special comments by some of our audience members. So in the very beginning, let me invite Mr. Aditya Junjunwala, the president of ISMA, 
for those for an initiated, it's the Indian Sugar Mills Association. You could either come on stage or we can get you a mic, whichever you prefer. Good morning, everyone and dignitaries on the dais and off the dais. This is my pleasure to be here and address this gathering. I would like to begin with expressing my gratitude to the Ministry of Petroleum and Natural Gas for taking this initiative to organize such an important seminar for the industry. Biofuel is a critical topic for all the stakeholders, the government, industry, and the society. I am glad that we are all together to discuss its potentials here. Our success in crossing 10% blending for ethanol in record time and our target for reaching 20% by 2025 hinges on the contribution of the sugar mills of India, which supplies more than half of its ethanol along with other stakeholders who have helped to achieve this goal. It's a matter of immense pride for me that ISMA members have already demonstrated their commitments to the environment as well as creating an art nirmal Bharat by rising up to this challenge of scaling ethanol production within their mills. In fact, I'm aware that many of our peers in the industry have also setting up the grain based distilleries within the mills to ensure round of year supply of ethanol, which is a very important thing which was lagging behind. A lot of this has been possible only with the government mandates and the policies of the department. We can today envision a future where sugar mills will become India two biorefineries producing cogen, ethanol, and other energies like biocompressed gas, aviation fuel, 2G ethanol, green methanol, and green hydrogen. We are sincerely looking into it to convert or maybe diversify our Indian sugar into Indian sugar and biorefineries, bio, uh, bioenergy manufacturing association. That is what we are looking at. However, sir, there are certain critical challenges that we need to address. Two of our partners in the Global Biofuel Alliance, Brazil, has a Renova biofuel policy providing carbon credits for ethanol production, and the US passed the Inflation Reduction Act in 2022, giving significant tax credits for ethanol production, adopting new technologies. In India, we do not have differentiate between a low carbon producing pathway or a higher one, which has become making ethanol, if our common goals of keeping the temperature rise limited to be achieved. In our opinion, this needs to be done on a higher priority. With development like CCTS in India, the CBAM in UE, and all of us need to adopt a new global matrix, the carbon emission in our policy making as well as reporting, and appropriate incentives needs to be given to actors working in this direction. Sir, I would also like to raise this point. We need to have a clarity and a clear roadmap and a policy for adopting E100 fuels as prevalent in Brazil. E100 can be dispersed directly at a reasonable price to a consumer. It also saves the transportation cost. Sir, this required a policy needs to be discussed and implemented with help of all the stakeholders. As you rightly said about the 2G ethanol, we are also looking, acknowledge fact, there's a bit of business risk when it comes to adopting new technology on the 2G ethanol or CBGs. And the assurance through mandates or otherwise will go a long way in boosting this confidence of the investor. Sir, also, the law of the land today for converting this spent wash into uh, insulation needs to be re-looked in, as the spent wash is highly have an organic material which can be converted into CBG and a biogas. So we need to understand what is prevalent in other parts of the world, how can we use that facility that we have to convert into CBG and biogas. Despite being one of the few industries that can boast of having a year-round constant feedstock, both efficiency of plant as well as offtake of the bioenergy produced is becoming an issue. The former can be only solved with a better research that we request the Ministry of Petroleum to conduct such capacity building activities, especially for the sugar industry, as well as existing CBG targets under Satat, a major contribution can be come from us, sir. In conclusion, I would like to reiterate that the Indian sugar industry is committed to contributing towards the country's biofuel story and creating a sustainable future. 
We are already taking steps to scale up ethanol production and also exploring new forms of bioenergy such as CBG, 2G ethanol, and green methanol and green hydrogen. Thank you, sir. Um, may I now invite Mr. Samir Sinha, uh, CEO Triveni, to share his thoughts with us. Uh, good morning, my distinguished uh, members on the dais and my equally distinguished members of the dais. It's my pleasure to be addressing you over here. And thank you for providing me this opportunity. Uh, I represent Triveni Engineering and Industries Limited, which is the second largest uh, supplier of ethanol in the 1G program. And uh, we are also evaluating uh, other uh, options for valorization in this sector. I wish to take this opportunity to speak on the potential supply side of the biofuels and especially the huge potential that is possible from the sugar industry in terms of numbers. We all know in uh, 1G it's already been talked about how we have moved over here and uh, at 12%, 375 crore liters after, out of the 515 crore liters is coming from the sugar industry. That's point number one. Uh, the point number two over here is that, and which is a more important thing, is that the sugar industry produces bagasse over here, which is ideally suited for 2G ethanol. In my opinion, the total surplus bagasse from the sugar industry is capable of uh, adding another 330 crore liters, which is equivalent to 6% of blending coming in, uh, uh, getting added to the fuel mix. This will be realized not only through standalone 2G plants, but also, which involve high capexes, but also through bolt-on 2G plants uh, attached to the existing distillery in the sugar complex to supplement the feedstock. This does require overcoming some technological risk uh, as well as policy uh, uh, ambiguities, but we are sure that we'll overcome it very soon. The second point is in terms of the press mud in the sugar industry. This has the potential to produce up to seven to eight lakh metric tons of CBG over here. And it has the potential to take off immediately. This is a very large number that we are talking about. Now, if you look at all the above, which is 1G, 2G, CPG, they lend themselves for scaling up for producing SAF and later on green hydrogen or even hydro uh, CH4 by adding a hydrogen molecule over there. However, the most importantly, with focus in terms of technology and R&D now happening on agriculture, I expect the yields of cane to increase by another 10 tons of, uh, per hectare of sugar cane, up from 80 tons per hectare in the next four to five years. This can additionally lead to a production of about 375 crore liters. So this shows that the potential uh, that can be unlocked of the biofuels from the supply side, and not only can we meet the, easily meet the SAF blending targets, but also cross the Brazilian baseline standards of E27 in the coming four or five years. That's a very important point I wanted to stress. And it must also be kept in mind that sugar industry is a very organized aggregator and producer of all the above feedstocks. So therefore, there's no risk in terms of, uh, of, of uh, the collection and aggregation of feedstocks. Therefore, biofuels is an exciting sector for sustainable tomorrow. And this uh, alliance, apart from energy security, climate mitigation, international trade, also leads to inclusive growth, something which the Honorable Prime Minister has been stressing upon through income enhancement of our farmers in rural areas. And we are committed to providing all the support and assistance for this alliance. Thank you very much. Let me thank you for the strong voice of support. Together we grow. Uh, let me now invite Ms. Preeti Jain, uh, Global Director, Lanzatech. We have a lot of cooperation with Lanzatech across multiple biofuel pathways. I'm sure she'll share some of these with us today. Thank you. Honorable Secretary on the desk, distinguished guest, 
on the dais as well as in the room, uh, fraternity, biofuel fraternity from India and overseas. The moment we all entered in this building, I think we all were talking about how, you know, magnificent is the structure is. So I think all of you will agree with me that foundation is very important when it comes to great architecture. And I would superimpose that for Indian biofuel industry. When I look at Indian biofuel industry and being in industry for just two decades, I must say that and applaud the policies which have been there, especially to make not just industry grow incrementally, but also allowing advanced biofuels to grow. Especially when I look at the policy, inclusion of all sustainable feedstocks, whether it is waste, whether it is 1G, 2G, and not only that, ensuring that these new technologies start to run before they run for a marathon, providing viability gap funding kind of schemes. I think these are very important steps which have brought us to where we are today. But as they say, there is always a room to do more. And as a innovation leader in the carbon recycling space from Lanzatech, we truly believe that each carbon which is there shouldn't be wasted. It should be recycled again and again and again. I also must mention in Indian oil, we have a valuable partner, not only to decarbonize road transport, but as well as aviation transport. But sir, we shouldn't stop there. When it comes to bioeconomy and biofuels, biochemicals has a very important role to play. And I must reiterate our commitment not only for the biofuel and chemical sector in the industry, but also for hard to decarbonize industry. The last point which I would like to mention on this, uh, at this forum is, we have a vision from Honorable Prime Minister for Make in India. And that Make in India can only happen when we go at a incremental, at go, go at a exponential step that is bringing policies which brings market creation a strong market creation will truly unleash the true potential of advanced biofuel through mandates, through pricing, as well as allowing capital support. Because we shouldn't forget that these technologies are new, capital intensive, and they need a hand holding before they reach to full potential. So I will stop there and again submit our full support to this fraternity and to the government of India. Thank you once again for that voice of support. May I now invite Mr. Vikram Gulati, Country Head and Executive Vice President of Toyota Kirloskar, from a, to give a consumer's perspective on things. Uh, dignities on the dais, uh, friends, a very good morning. At the outset, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to share my thoughts. Broadly, I'm going to very brief talk, going to talk about just two parts. One is our global journey towards sustainable mobility, and second one is what we've learned and what we like to share. Uh, over the last five to six decades, we've been working on di very diverse set of uh, sustainable technologies in the four-wheeler space, which includes alternate fuels like uh, biofuels and also electrified vehicles. In fact, having sold over 22.5 million electrified vehicles, that includes the hydrogen vehicle Mirai sold in 2000, introduced in 2014, and a very exciting prospect which is relevant today, which is the introduction of an electrified uh, flexi fuel vehicle in Brazil in 2019. So that has a combination of a flexi fuel. Uh, engine combined with an electric powertrain, which offsets the fuel efficiency loss that's usually associated with higher levels of ethanol use. In 2015, Global took, uh, Toyota took globally six environment cha challenges, three of which are achieving zero carbon emissions. Of these, we plan to achieve zero carbon emission from our manufacturing units by 2035. And in India, I'm happy to tell you, we'll be doing it in a couple of years from now. And the other two are around zero carbon emissions, and not only from the tailpipe of the vehicles that we produce, but from the life cycle of the vehicles that we are responsible for. And these are very serious, and we're committed to these challenges. Now, our learnings. Uh, first and most important learning that we've seen uh, over our uh, very long journey in very diverse markets is a multiple technology pathway is absolutely essential 
towards achieving rapid shift towards sustainability away from fossil fuels and lowering carbon emissions. Uh, that's very simple to understand because consumer needs are very diverse. Therefore, these diverse sets are met by diverse technologies. But there's a very uh, important additional element which is very relevant for India. For the space of cars, last fiscal year, which has just ended, we sold around 3.8 million cars and SUVs. By the pace of growth we are going at, it is projected by 2030 will be around perhaps eight to nine million new vehicles sold. Now you can do the math. If we achieve our stated target of 30 by 30 for electric vehicles, the number of vehicles we might be selling which are non-electric, non-addressed, are going to be probably you know 1.6 to 1.7 times today. And the vehicles on the roads, which are non-addressed, are going to be upwards of 92%. Therefore the impact on fossil fuel consumption and carbon is easy to see. Therefore, multiple technology pathway is very relevant. Second, this mix of multiple technologies is unique for each market. Why? Because the readiness of the market in terms of infrastructure, the energy mix that the market has in terms of strength, consumer acceptance, and most importantly, the readiness and maturity of the local manufacturing ecosystem from the automotive side are very diverse. Now, if you look at these two learnings and apply to India, clearly alternate fuels and biofuels have a very important role to play going ahead. And we're thankful to the government for taking this initiative and pushing uh, biofuels. And we feel that the impact is gonna be huge. It's already been spoken about. Uh, Last point from my side would be we've done huge amount of work in terms of supply side. We've done a lot of work in terms of policy interventions on the fuel side. Probably on the vehicle side also, it's now time that suitable merit-based uh, policy, especially around taxation, be introduced so that consumers are able to adopt these technologies in a larger number. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, now may I invite Ms. Rebecca Groen, CEO of Shiv Energy Futura, to share her comments. Good morning, everybody, and thank you so much for this opportunity. Secretary, you have totally made my day by saying RDME. That's just the most exciting thing I've heard all year so far. Um, and I'm really excited about the opportunity that we all have in the biofuels space to really make a difference. Because what we've heard today with all of the different presentations is that if India wants to do something, it can and it will do it really, really well. So I'm dreaming about R10, which is RDME with LPG because SHV Energy, as the chairman of course knows, uh, in the World LPG Association, is really looking out for the millions and billions of customers around the world who rely on LPG as their source of energy. Off-grid, decentral energy sources for food, for cooking, for industrial heating, for process heat, for heating houses, and for transport. All of those applications are extremely difficult to decarbonize, but actually we don't need to decarbonize them, we need to defossilize them. And defossilize is the word that we are all looking at actually when it comes to biofuels. If we can make that a really viable way of developing fuels using feedstock, agricultural residues, crops, recycled carbon to make a fuel that can be easily transported and used by all of those customers who want safe and efficient and affordable energy source, we really start to make a difference. So everything that I've heard so far this morning, all of the friends here on the panel and here in the room, I think together we can start to do that. We are really like-minded. SHV Energy has a wonderful business here in uh, India called Supergas, and we're proud of our customers and our heritage but we're extremely small. So we know we rely on the collaboration with other parties to make it happen. When we start to think about how we could take available agricultural residues with modular torrefaction, gasification, direct synthesis to DME, that really is gonna to start to be a compelling business case that offers value to the farmers 
I mean, the eight billion and five billion for farmers, that is just the most wonderful sales pitch there is. We can do the same when we start thinking about how we need to use the availability of resources for all of the applications that we currently have and how we start to put that together. So we're here with the consortium and we're talking to various different people about how we make that happen. We're a small, globally, a Dutch-based, uh, privately owned company, but we are ready and willing to invest and collaborate with those to make it happen because we really believe there's an opportunity and India is about the best place to make it happen. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Rebecca. It's, it's good to hear when people say that India is the best country to make things happen. It, it resounds a lot well with us. And, and of course, we have a proven track record to show that. Um, may I now invite uh, Mr. Sanjeev Gupta, Chairman and Managing Director, Imitis, to share his thoughts with us. Uh, if he's not here with us, then may I invite Mr. Sandeep Chaturvedi, Chairman, Biodiesel Association of India. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to my city. Quite impressed and very well thought speech by Honorable Secretary. He, in fact, summed up the entire journey that we have started from 2015 till now with a lot of missed starts and then right steps, but we are now consistently doing biodiesel in quite substantial volumes. So the last cycle that we did was almost six crore liters in just, uh, I think, one and a half months. The current cycle of next quarter that we're doing, that is up to July, is around 21 crore liters. And thereafter, very closely working with the oil marketing companies and <coughs> my colleagues are here. So we intend to do around 100 crore liters for the entire cycle for the year 23, 24. I think if I miss something, it will be October till September of 24, we will be doing 100 crore liters, which is a Phenomenal number as far as biodiesel goes, because I still remember the best number that we did was in 2020. And thereafter, there was a gap of two years because of corona. Vegetable oils were not available. And along with this, we have been working very hard on locally generated feedstocks like used cooking oil. And the potential are great, almost 3 million tons. That is what the uh, Food Standards Authority of India has mapped out. We have worked very closely with them on the RUCO program. So that is something that over a period of time will help us decarbonize or defossilize our uh, diesel requirements as rightly pointed out by some speakers here. And uh, diesel means a lot to the Indian economy. Even a small percentage point has got a direct impact on the day-to-day -day lives, because most of the road transportation still and heavily depends on diesel fuel. See, when I started my journey in biodiesel, it was 40 million was the annual consumption of diesel, and today we touch 100 millions. So the growth that is happening, earlier it used to be 6%, and now, as pointed out by Chairman IOC, that it is 2.02%, which is much higher than the global growth rate, so with that, I would say globally there is an opportunity in India in two sectors in biodiesel. One would be carbon trading. Because as of now, as we speak, there is nothing that has been done. But I understand that various departments of the government are working on carbon trading. Second would be investment into technology. There is a big need for investments into technology. There are local technology players, yes. And thirdly would be the trading community, which is completely absent in India, which is there elsewhere in America, in Europe. The markets are very matured. So this will be very interesting opportunity when we talk of G20. Uh, so partners can look into these two distinguished fields, which are available. And I would uh, believe that the Petroleum Ministry would rightly publish a white paper or something for people to understand the Indian market and pick up the investments. Thank you.
Thanks a lot. Uh, we would now almost bring our last session, uh, I mean, the first session of the day to a close. In this context, let me again invite uh, an expert from the automobile industry. India is ramping up its automobile use and production. Um, we are almost the third largest market in the world as our economy speeds up, as our economy is on a high trajectory of growth. And as we add more and more population to the middle class, the demand for automobiles is only expected to increase. So I'm sure uh, Mr. P.K. Banerjee would share his ideas with us uh, from, a more, from, a, from a larger perspective from the automobile sector on how decarbonization of this sector is at the heart of one of our ideas. Good morning, dignitaries on and off the dais. Representing automobile industry, I'm very privileged and proud to get this opportunity. Core of sustainability is circularity. And I represent the user industry. 20 million gasoline vehicles are being introduced every year in the country. We have 200 million gasoline vehicles running on road. And it gives the immense potential and opportunity to embrace quickly the ethanol in the form of E20 and flex fuel vehicles. And I'm very proud to present to you that with the cooperation, collaboration, and consistency of policy intervention by the government of India envisioned under the leadership of Honorable Secretary Pankaj Janji, Indian automobile industry has crossed the very important milestone on 1st April 2023. And now all our vehicles which is being produced are E20 material compliant. So therefore, we are ready to take off. And we have already demonstrated flex fuel vehicles technology. Honorable Secretary mentioned that Indian mobility requirements are very unique. We have 100 cc two-wheeler bikes and our 1,000 persons are having only 145 bikes per 1,000 penetration. So mobility inclusive needs are going to grow tremendously. And there is a huge potential to actually replicate, understand the Brazilian example. And this is a reflection of collaboration. And that's how the Indo-Brazil, Indo-US collaboration envisioned by the government of India we also, as a SIAM, have entered with UNICA MOU, and also we have entered with US Grain Council MOU. And ISMA is our great partner in the country, and collectively we are able to move forward very confidently. And I'm sure that this platform of international cooperation is going to take us to the path of sustainability. As Gulati San mentioned, that the Options of all technology acceptance in the country is the way forward. There is no one single cellular bullet. And if the transition of the transition from current decarbonization intent has to happen uninterrupted, then this is the way forward for us because more than 800 companies in the country are deeply saddled into ICE vehicle technology. So whether we embrace tomorrow hydrogen or we embrace uh, the technology related to flex fuel. I think the role of ICE vehicle will continue to be there. So therefore, without undermining the, you know, a particular technology, we would like to continue to remain technology agnostic. And I assure you that with the collaboration, cooperation, and consistency of policy, both in the f term of policy of uh, providing fuel at a certain specifications because you know that our industry has a long lead time of development because we need to give the customer the durable products which needs testing for more than 1.6 kilometer as a mandate. So therefore, 
consistency of the specification of fuel will be very important. So we continue to remain dedicated to work towards the vision of the government of India and wish that this particular alliance will become a great success and bring a sustainable future, one earth, one family and one future. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, before we break for tea, uh, can I request if there are any concluding remarks from anyone on the dais? If, if there are not, I was sitting with the Brazilians and they were saying, um, in terms of ethanol, we drink the best and drive the rest. Uh, I'll change it a little bit for India. We also drink the best and drive the rest, but we drink the best tea. So let me invite you for a tea break right now while we continue this conversation, and then we'll start with the next session in about 10 to 15 minutes. Thank you all for your patience.
Yeah. Check, my check. Yep. Good afternoon. May I request everyone to take up your seats? We'll just get started. And I'm just going to walk out and invite people to step in. Maybe we'll just give 30 seconds more. So, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you for coming in for this second seminar. Uh, please allow me to call this session to order. Welcome to the second session, the second seminar on the sidelines of the ETWG. Uh, in Mumbai. My name is Rahul Pai Panandikar. I'm a managing director and senior partner with the Boston Consulting Group. I have the very simple uh, honor and privilege of being your host and moderator for this session for over the next 40, 45 minutes. Uh, and I have the honor of having on stage with us an eminent panel, uh, people who worked in the industry, practitioners, not consultants like me, who can give their points of view and perspectives on the necessity of actually collaborating and cooperating to make sure that we give enough oxygen to this new initiative that's taking shape all over the world. Uh, let me call on stage uh, the distinguished panel. May I first call on Dr. Uh, Ram Kumar? And as he walks up, I'll put up some brief introductory remarks about Dr. Ram Kumar, which who needs no introduction. He's the director of R&D and a board member of the Indian Oil Corporation. Uh, he's a pioneer in various alternative energy programs, including waste to energy, bio, solar, and energy storage. Uh, has a huge legacy of publications in international journals and patents. Uh, he's instrumental in development of India's homegrown OEM approved marine lubricant technology uh, and has been on multiple panels associated with renewable energies and sustainability. Thank you, Dr. Ramkumar. May I also invite on stage uh, Mr. Bharatan, uh, Director of Refineries of HPCL. Besides having led uh, the refinery operations of HPCL and operations and technical departments of Mumbai and the, the Vizag Refinery for over 25 years, he also leads uh, HPCL's Green R&D Center in Bengaluru. Uh, and under him, HPCL Green R&D Center has, has now filed about 380 patents. Wow. Thank you, Mr. Bharatan. May I also invite on stage uh, Mr. Ravi, Mr. P.S. Ravi from BPCL. He's the head of the Renewable Energy Division of uh, Bharat Petroleum. Uh, he's also led the retail business for Bharat Petroleum uh, and has, led many, has had, held many positions in the oil and gas industry uh, from in both sales and operations. He is now leading the industry group for improving the ethanol blending percentage in the country as in responsible to create capacities in the country to achieve the vision 20%, which is already done, surpassing the 10% that we had. May I also invite on stage uh, Mr. Atul Mule. Uh, for those who don't know, uh, Mr. Mule is the founding member of uh, Praj Industries. Uh, Praj has been ranked as the second hottest co global, uh, company globally by the US-based biofuels digest in low carbon fuels and renewable chemicals category. He has to his credit a Fulbright scholarship from the United States of America and has completed his global leadership management through the scholarship of Tepper School of Business, Carnegie Mellon. 
He's a member of the Biofuel Working Group under the MOPNG, the Biofuel Advisory Committee of the Maharashtra Government, uh, the, task, the, the National Task Force on Sugar and Ethanol of CII, and is a founder member and chairman of the Bioeconomy Committee of Indian Federation of Green Energy. Thank you, gentlemen. Let me take about a few minutes to actually just set the stage on the discussion. The first session was a lot about uh, the importance, the necessity, the relevance, the salience of biofuels and bioenergy as a whole. Uh, and I'll put it in two, three contexts. The first is just understanding the context. The world will need energy. Yes, we will need it in an affordable, reliable, and a sustainable way, but we will need energy. And it's in the backdrop of the fact that the world is heading to a net zero situation due to the climate impact. And hence we have, quote unquote, these competing points in which the growth of energy is a given in some ways, and at the same time we need to cut down to make sure that we are gonna do it in a defossilized, decarbonized way. Each country has had a very variable starting point. Each country has its very distinct socioeconomic and uh, other compulsions. And hence, each country in some way or form has made the commitment, the nationally committed uh, uh, timelines in a very different way. What's also very clear is that there is no singular pathway. Many of the speakers in the morning have very clearly stated that, that there is no singular pathway, whether it's technology, whether it's in any other way or form that actually defines how every country is going to do this. But there is a consensus around one thing, which is very clear this morning, is that bioenergy or biofuels, which has, by the way, been one of the oldest technologies in low carbon solutions in many ways, is actually going to be preeminent as we look into the solution space. And so we see that biofuel will play an important part of the low carbon solutions pathway that any country is going to choose. We've done some analysis, and I think there was a lot of numbers thrown about, but it's very clear that the growth of biofuels in the basket of any country is going to grow up multifold. Whether it's the IES predictions, whether it's the BP predictions, the number is anywhere between three to six and a half times what we are at the current moment. We are at about three to four, and I wanna make the units uniform because everyone uses a different unit, three to four exajoules, of, of energy coming from it, we anticipate that number to be anywhere between 15 and 25 exajoules going forward. But I also wanna stress a point that the Secretary made. This is not just about a defossilization or a decarbonization pathway issue. This is also a huge business opportunity. Within a time frame of the next seven to 10 years, we anticipate that the global profit pool just on SAF could, uh, SAF and renewable diesel could hit about 100 billion US dollars. Now that's also a significant business opportunity. The benefits are very clear. We anticipate that if we can reach this potential of bioenergy and biofuels, we could cut global CO2 emissions by 1.3 to 1.4 billion tons of carbon dioxide per annum. That's about 3.5% of the CO2 emissions today. And that's a huge and significant contribution to the defossilization or decarbonization of the global uh, situation. That's the good part of the story. And it's really good to see the impetus that's building up in the audience with regards to biofuels. But for all practical purposes, let me lay the stake in the ground. Biofuels as a commitment to the globe is what we call off track. In the next seven years alone, an additional 400 to 500 billion US dollars of investment is required if we are to keep up with the commitments we have made as a part of the net zero scenarios. And so, while we can pat ourselves on the back of the lovely pilots and the proofs of concept and everything that's being done, and I think multiple speakers have said that, the need for acceleration, if I were to use the word hyper acceleration is more than here. We are way off track in terms of the commitments we've made with regards to biofuels. And there's two things that are required, and I wanna simplify it. The audience and the gentlemen on stage will give you all the other part. One is just the feedstock, and how do we do, uh, how do we unlock the potential of how do we aggregate feedstock, the different types of feedstock? And the second is the development of technology, which I think we have eminent people who'll speak about that on the stage. 
What's very clear to us, and this is actually the focus of this session of the seminar, is that this is not going to happen because one country has solved it. This is going to happen if the, there's a mechanism of cooperation and collaboration that is created on three different fronts. The first, clearly, on technology. There are leaders of technology in the world, whether it's a Brazil or whether it's the United States or whether it's an SV, SHV, uh, building that up. But there's many other parts of the world where these experiments are happening almost, uh, you know, the rigor from, from ab initio basis. And I think that's something that needs to be talked about and figure out how do we create this. The second is policy, and I think a lot of, uh, whether it's the end user's policy required, whether it's policy for the producers, whether it's on the feedstock side, whether it's on the agriculture side, I think a lot of what George said was a whole of government approach is required so that there's coherence and cogence in the policy making environment itself. You can't solve the ice problem without solving the agriculture problem, without solving the water problem, without solving the land use problem. So there's a lot of things that need to be happening there. And to extend the policy part, I'll say policy and uh, regulation, if we were to put it that way. And the last part, which I think a lot of people have talked about, is just, you know, which is a challenge all through with regards to everything that has to do with sustainability is sustainable finance. Where are we going to get this 400 or 500 billion US dollars from? At what rates are going to come? What form of financing is going to come? But my goal is to just set the state, stage. I'm asking more questions than I have answers for. I'll leave it to our eminent panelists to actually give us some of these answers. But what's very clear is that a global biofuels alliance or some form of a biofuels alliance is now more than required to bring together the knowledge bases, the technology bases, the policy and the regulatory frameworks that have been created all over the world in a way that it can be brought on one platform and one framework so that we can get into this phase of hyper acceleration. I'll stop there. Let me invite uh, Dr. Ram Kumar to make some initial remarks uh, on the stage. Thank you, Rahul, for that, those kind words of introduction and uh, distinguished delegates, my fellow panelists on the dais. Uh, I thank Ministry of Petroleum and Natural Gas for giving me this opportunity to be a part of this uh, all-important sideline event of G20 on biofuels. So I couldn't agree more with uh, Mr. Rahul that uh, as a nation and as a company, global biofuel alliance among G20 nations is the need of the hour in our quest for pursuing low carbon yet energy secure future. So there is no two ways about it that uh, a company like ours, the largest company and uh, a nation uh, which is having as in the morning session, uh, many speakers talked about the growing energy appetite. We need both energy security and uh, we need low carbon future. So biofuel, biofuel is an important strategic perspective for any, for any entity and more so for oil and gas entities which are much larger in size like ours. So having said that, uh, Rahul asked me, I mean I, I'll, I'll take this uh, to give some technology imperatives, being, being from R&D. So that would be a little easier for me. Uh, rather than narrating, um, narrating what we have been doing, in fact, uh, in the morning, Chairman Indian Oil has already highlighted some of the um, revolutionary initiatives that Indian Oil has already taken in the arena of biofuel, rather than the conventional, uh, conventional uh, uh, biofuel arena. So, as far as technology is concerned, we have just commissioned Asia's biggest second generation ethanol plant. But still, from the technology viewpoint, my, my technology collaborator is here, that uh, the last word on enzyme technology is still not spoken, which is the critical component for second generation ethanol production from agri residues. So, I think this global alliance uh, would serve well if 
one of the imperatives should be that uh, we would be collaborating among the research institutions of G20 nations to exchange the knowledge about second generation enzyme. We have already started, let me, let me apprise that under the aegis of ministry. We have already started uh, this kind of exchange with uh, Brazil. Uh, there, is a, there is a laboratory called LNBR. Uh, it's, it's a part of the umbrella, umbrella group of scientific institutions of Brazil. We embarked upon benchmarking the 2G enzyme technology that we developed versus what they have developed. And uh, we want to find out some gap areas, but the ultimate objective is to scale up these activities. While, while on the subject of uh, second, generation, uh, second generation ethanol, I think most of my uh, uh, fellow panelists would agree with me, lignin is a, is a big problem. The yield even today with the best of technology that Mrs. Praz is sitting here, yield per ton of uh, biomass uh, agricultural residue is only 27%, mere 27%. There's a huge and humongous amount of uh, byproduct, unwanted product as of now, which is, which is lignin. So there is a need for global biofuel alliance if second generation pathways have to become more strident, more cost effective, then we need to, we need to work as a committee of nations of G20 on how to valorize lignin so that the bottom lines of second generation ethanol technologies will be improved. There are several pathways. I mean, it's not that the work is not going on. Even within the country, there is so many groups, including PRAS, including Indian Oil R&D, HPCL, BPCL, every one of us are working on how to valorize lignin. There are some successes, but these are all at, at best, they are at TRL. TRL3 or TRL4 scale. So there is a need to scale them up, there is a need to accelerate them, and there is a need to valorize them. And a third technology imperative is, uh, is synthetic biology. I mean, you may call it as synthetic biology or genetic engineering. I think now there is no need of Using the euphemism of synthetic, uh, synthetic biology, we can, we can straight away call it as genetic engineering now. It is more accepted uh, scientific uh, domain today all over the world. So I think there is a need for us to work on synthetic uh, biology domain so that uh, the biocatalysts need to be engineered to, to get the desired product slate at desired yield percentages whether it is biomethanation, whether it is second generation ethanol, whether it is third generation ethanol, biocatalyst holds the key. And for biocatalyst to be fine-tuned to our liking on the product side, we need to engage as a group in synthetic biology. Biomethanation, I think there is a, there is a flagship program of uh, Ministry of Petroleum and Natural Gas uh, under the name Satat, and all the oil marketing companies who are sitting here, we are the front runners in, uh, in advancing this cause, and uh, each one of us are giving LOIs. There are five technologies which are recognized by Ministry of Petroleum and Natural Gas to convert organic waste into uh, biogas. But still, again, there is no last word as yet spoken on the biomethanation technology. Because biomethanation technology cannot be measured only on the basis of yield of the biogas and methane content of the biogas, but the byproduct is extremely valuable. This morning also many speakers talked about the fermented organic manure or uh, liquid fermented organic manure. And to get the desired quality of LFOM, to be valorized, then uh, whether your biomethanation technology is feedstock agnostic or not, or necessarily you have to confine yourself to certain feedstocks. I think that is a big technology imperative today to take this entire initiative to the next level so that again cost efficiencies can go up. The fourth, the fourth imperative, it is 
I don't know whether it is technology imperative or not for an R&D uh, person whether to talk about this or not, but my entire R&D interventions are coming to a knot without this imperative. So I would, I would be tempted to make this uh, at, uh, attempt that the G20 Biofuel Alliance need to work on some business innovation on the supply chain management of the feedstocks. I mean, we have learned it the hard way. Indian oil has learned it the hard way. I don't have any qualms in ag agreeing to this, that we are struggling to get uh, the requisite quality and quantity of uh, biomass for whatever ventures that we have started, be it in biomethanation space or in se second generation ethanol space. So I think a, a collective universal business innovation is the need of the hour. The, some policy framework for aggregation and allocation. More than aggregation, it is the allocation mechanism of the biomass, available biomass to a particular technology entity need to be put in place from the policy viewpoint. If we have to, if we have to advance ourselves into, in this biofuel domain. I hope that uh, Biofuel Alliance of G20 will attempt and address these kind of uh, technology issues. I think I'll stop here for the moment and I'll interact as the session goes by. Thank you, Dr. Ram Kumar, for these incredibly specific situations and examples where collaboration and cooperation is going to become absolutely critical. I think you've named three. I'm sure we have many more that can come up, and I'm sure there are many in the audience who have thoughts and comments on how some of them have gone ahead as well in terms of the technology part. Uh, let me now call upon Mr. Bharatan to address uh, the audience, his initial remarks. Thank you, Rahul. Good afternoon, all. So uh, Dr. Rangkumar has well covered on all the technology imperatives, so fully agree with him and uh, not more than, cannot add more than what he has uh, told. I will just start with uh, introducing to what HPCL is doing in biofuels. Many of you may be aware, but to have a recap of, uh, so, so we, HPCL is actually, I don't know how many of you know, uh, operate sugar plants. We operate sugar plant for more than a decade and whatever Ch secretary was telling, the variation, variability in the business, we are fully aware of it. We have gone through that uh, experience and now we are expanding those sugar mills to operate around the year in by including food grains and uh, maize also into the uh, unit so that we run the uh, sugar distillery round the clock basis. So that is our, uh, this is more than 10 years old and uh, the, we are constructing a 2G ethanol plant, which is an advanced stage of mechanical completion. Again, the technology provider is here. Uh, hope we will learn from uh, IOC's experience and we will commission the plant in a smoother way in the uh, early next year. The next one, what we have just commissioned is our large biomass-based uh, biomethane um, plant in Badon, U UP, which has been uh, commissioned about two months back. Uh, that is also struggling for feedstock, but nevertheless, to start with, we have uh, stuffed enough stock to run for the next two, three months, and then we are looking to expand it in a sustainable way. The, uh, we are also planning an integrated CBG come uh, bio to second generation ethanol plant uh, in East Godavari district, Andhra. Hope that will fructify shortly and uh, uh, that will be one of the model unit for us where we intend to valorize several of these byproducts what we have been talking about. There are several other CBG plants which like any other OMC we are also supporting. There are several biodiesel plants, smaller plants what we are uh, supporting and uh, so on and uh, so forth. Now quickly coming to the technologies, Dr. Rankumar has already covered all. I will add few technological challenges not in the uh, core uh, area but we do have problems on the feed preparation area where many of the plants are struggling in the initial days. So the feed preparation, which is simple mechanical operations, there are challenges with respect to the availability of the uh, better process. The machinery is getting improved day as uh, more plants come. I think that is one area where we can take the experience of the nations which have already uh, mastered that or they have gone ahead 
in the in the past few years so uh, mechanical operations for feed preparation process separation separation processes are uh, in a refinery we are all well aware of and uh, all possible separation processes are operated in a refinery but most energy efficient way and the biological processes have some certain differences which you will have to bring upon so i think these two combined with the biochemical heart of the process if they are successfully done then any plant will be standing on its own strength on an economic basis uh, i will now come to the uh, alliances which you are talking about multination uh, alliances hpcl is a part of stakeholders group of advanced biofuels which were all omcs and the premier institutes of india are part of uh, it it was formed under european union india clean energy and climate partnership program about nine european countries are uh, partner of that we had the first meeting in the february in bangalore uh, where there are eight tasks that have been uh, identified which starts from life cycle analysis for various feedstock conversion processes carbon uh, accounting for the different conversion what we are doing different fuels we are doing capability identification training needs research needs and so on and so forth so that group is working well we have a fixed timeline of completing the task by march uh, next year Uh, this is one uh, example of what already we are doing with some uh, few countries the next one we are also part of india energy international energy agency bio energy program task 34 34 which is thermochemical liquefaction of biomass there was a meeting conducted by us in uh, january in hpcl green r and d center bangalore where the european union members who were part of that had actually participated in a knowledge sharing session there is we are also part of task 37 which is uh, biogas energy from biogas where we had conducted a similar knowledge sharing session again in our hpcl green r&d center just last week more than 12 countries uh, members from more than 12 countries participated in that now these are some of the examples of what already we have started uh, aligning with some of the similar minded countries but when we expand this with the more like minded countries definitely it will be helpful for all of us to grow and accelerate the implementation and acceptation acceptance of this bio fuel program so with this few words i think uh, as we go along some more points are there i will cover thank you for the opportunity thank you all thank you mr bharathan uh, for identifying what i think hpcl has taken the lead on in terms of building some initiatives complementing it with technologies that are a part of the broader ecosystem that we need to solve as well not just the core issues i think that dr ram kumar has raised and also highlighting a few of the alliances that you're working on i think as we go forward it will be good to understand what's working well in these alliances and what do we need to do more as we go forward in a practical sense to make sure that you know there's something tangible that comes out may i now invite uh, mr ravi to come and uh, give his introductory remarks on what's happening at bpcl and or any other thoughts on technology policy regulation and alliances <clears throat> uh thank you mr rahul dignitary is on the dais dignitary is here seated in front uh good afternoon to all of you as i stand and speak before you uh do i am from bharat petroleum but i am representing the oil industry that is indian oil hindustan petroleum and <clears throat> bharat petroleum you know who have successfully implemented the ethanol blending program we were just about 5% in the year 2019 20 and within 3 years we have now crossed 10% and we are already at 12% <clears throat> so as far as my initial thoughts on the collaboration uh for development of uh, and development and adoption of this biofuels amongst we all countries uh so let me uh, start by I, i would like to make four short points the first one being it's important that demand needs to be created and for creating the demand it is important for us to understand which is the area or which is the largest energy end use sector that's very critical 
And in the case of India, it's transport. We all know that. And in transport, we also realize that in terms of number of vehicles, as Mr. Banerjee in the first session had stated, we have more than 200 million vehicles on the road. So it's important that these vehicles uh, are capable en enough to adopt biofuels. So uh, that has happened in India. So E10 has been successfully rolled out and that's how we have uh, achieved it. But going forward, uh, E20, which has been already rolled out. So I am sure India be being one of the leaders in terms of ICE technology for two wheelers uh, would be in a position to support and help the other countries in terms of uh, adoption of uh, two wheelers which can which can run on biofuels. As far as the passenger vehicle segment is concerned, yes, we have Brazil and US and the other countries who have successfully uh, rolled out models which run on biofuels, right up to E85 or E100. So there is a scope for us to learn, for India to learn from these countries. And uh, uh, <clears throat> we, instead of wasting time on development of technology, we can just uh, learn from them and adopt it. So collaboration in terms of vehicle technology is very critical amongst the countries. That's when the demand would get created. Having created the demand, the second one point which I would like to make is that using locally available biofuels, uh, feedstocks for making biofuels. That's very important. What is relevant for that country, what kind of a crop is grown in that country is very critical. Like for example, if you take the case of India, uh, the classic example is our sugarcane ecosystem which we have successfully created over the last few decades. Can this, get, can this be replicated across the feedstocks? Uh, uh, the previous speakers were talking about the 2G ethanol and the need for creating a, a, a mechanism for uh, aggregation and allocation of the agri-waste. <clears throat> so the way we have done it for sugarcane, I think already we in India have already started talking about can we do this for maize because maize is something which is less uh, uh, water dependent as compared to sugarcane or or rice. So this is, <clears throat> here what we need to do is create an ecosystem. Ecosystem creation is very, very critical. And second is for creating these ecosystems, policy interventions, remunerative pricing. And the third one is technology in inputs in increasing the yield per hectare. Very crucial. While sugarcane in, in, in India, I think over the last two decades, there has been, the acreage has remained, but if you look at the uh, 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 throughput or the availability, it has gone up substantially. So there has been a lot of technology inputs which has gone. This has been facilitated primarily because of the creation of this ecosystem. So technology, in, like, like I'm, uh, uh, the other day when we had the maize seminar, very clearly we found out that India is only two and a half tons per hectare in terms of production, whereas US, it's about 11, 11 to 12 uh, tons per hectare. So that clearly shows what kind of, well, the, the need for us to increase the yield and that's where the technology inputs are required. The third part is efficient conversion systems. <clears throat> 1G ethanol, lot of work has been done in India but then we still have a lot to learn uh, 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 because I, I believe the energy intensity per liter of ethanol is the least in US. So is there something we can learn from them? Second, uh, can I valorize the byproducts? I'm, I'm still talking of the 1G. For example, the DDGS. In US, they have brilliantly uh, valorized it. They have created a market for it. In fact, it is one of the uh, major revenue earner for a uh, ethanol distillery. So, uh, creating, and, and the third one is the yield, yield per ton of the grain or, or, or sugar cane. 
again is is something which we can uh, which we need to work on so the countries who are having expertise in this particular area if we are in a position to uh, exchange learn from each other rather than wait for us to develop in that particular area this would fast track adoption of biofuels in the country and last last piece which i would like to talk which is definitely uh, close to my heart is <clears throat> procurement storage and distribution of biofuels across the country 24 hours 365 days in the first session very clearly they said we as a country we are confident and we are excited in the space of biofuels this confidence stems from the fact that in the last 3 years we have successfully ensured availability of uh, biofuels across the country length and breadth of the country in 1920 we were hardly existent uh, we existed hardly in seven or eight states in the country and today it is across the country so the oil industry has worked hard on uh, on its procurement uh, strategies we have worked hard on the storage where do we store, store where it is important to uh, store we have created ethanol hubs so that we store ethanol in a big way large quantities and we also transport it across the country like indian oil uh, uh, when the need ar arose it transported all the way from haryana to northeast uh, hpcl from you know karnataka to parts of andhra pradesh and telangana and bpcl from maharashtra to and and uttar pradesh to uh, east and the southern parts of the country so creation i mean creation of all these procurement storage and distribution system is very very crucial for success of the biofuel program if that happens then only the adoption of biofuels will happen and the uh, automobile sector also will feel that much more confident to go in for newer technologies for higher blends uh, this is the these are the four points which i thought i would share with you thank you Thank you, Mr. Ravi, for, for providing uh, a few additional points on an emphasis on how do we uh, collaborate in terms of vehicle technologies and retrofitting, uh, you know, locally available feedstocks and how we need to develop the technologies that make that viable. The, the, the knowledge sharing, if I may, to make sure that we are, make sure that we're working all on absolutely the best of benchmarks globally. Uh, but let me now call on Mr. Mule, who I think is on the other side, being a solution provider, uh, to maybe address some of these thoughts, and I'm sure he's seen this in many parts of the world, so he can also enlighten the audience on, on what's best in class. Thank you, Mr. Rahul. Thank you, Mr. Rahul. Dignitaries on dais, Chairman I.S. Philip with this year, dignitaries of the dais. The theme is technology, and I, I am, again, I'm privileged to listen to the viewpoints given by my previous speakers. So when we talk about the technology, technology is one part of the only the business. But what is important is that acceptance and acknowledgement of technology is very important in any of the processes. And I am really happy uh, and really having a very pride moment that all these OMCs, whether it is IOCL, HPC or BPCL, has really given us an encouragement for developing this technology on a commercial basis. So on this platform, I really want to thank all of them, uh, IOCL, IOCL and BPCL. Whether it is second generation ethanol plant, whether it is CBG compressed biogas plant, whether it is 1G grain plant, we have been uh, privileged to have just working with this for developing this technology. Having said that, technology is one of the DNA of Rajasthan organization. Just to some recap, I want to just share in this August gathering that world's one of the largest plant of producing 1.2 million liters per day of ethanol, fuel ethanol in UK, even set up by us based on the wheat as raw material. Now today, in last 40 years, we have established plants over 100 countries, producing almost like 12 billion liters of ethanol, that is 1,200 kiloliters of ethanol, which is 8% of the global production, which comes from a Praj plant. Having said that, 1G, whether it is sugar, whether it is grain, second generation, compressed biogas plant. So probably it's a very unique position what we as a Praj, as an Indian company, really enjoying in having covering all these biofuel segment together and offering you know, the technology and EPC solution. Now, Mr. Ravi mentioned about the having local raw materials, one of the major thing, and he also mentioned about the success of the maize plants in the USA. 
So we have worked in USC also on the maze plan definitely. The important aspect is as having a hands-on experience of the raw material which is available locally. So we have a hand, almost like hand printed 8,000 samples of different samples from the sugar side and over 4,000 different grain samples globally. So whenever we offer a technology, this technology is completely mapped based on our technology center. Now what is there from the Indian biofuel industry? Indian biofuel industry has really seen a good growth in the last few years. And from the molasses or the sugar stream to grain is a major shift which we have achieved. Now while doing so, even sugar segment, as you have already given a differential pricing for C molasses, B molasses, syrup, cane juice syrup. So what is there new from us? So what is new from us is that we have developed a technology. Today there is a sugar cane juice syrup plant which are operational only during the season. And you, sugar cane juice is a perishable material you just can't store. So we have developed a technology where your sugar cane juice syrup can be stored for over one year. So they can use this store sugar syrup during off-season also. And such couple of commercial plants already in operation in India. So they have been storing the sugar and during off-season, they will use the sugar cane juice syrup, which will also help the sugar industry uh, in a much better way. So that's coming from the sugar side. While doing so, the one of the major difference between Brazil and India is that while doing so, India is actually more aggressive and effluent treatment norms. So zero liquid discharge is very, very predominant effluent treatment norm in India, which is not the case in Brazil. So today, while doing achieving all those numbers, the technology is also ensuring that we will have a zero liquid discharge technology coupled with lower water footprint. So these are the two technological advantages we give over Brazilians here. Having said that, coming back to the grain side of it, Grain today, most of us know, today we are using rice as a raw material. Maize is going to be in thing from now. In a rice, DDGS, as aptly mentioned by you, is one of the major co-product, which is actually giving you cross-subsidy of the ethanol price. Now, DDGS today, generally, since there is a demand supply gap is there, but DDGS over a period of time, DDGS is not only DDGS used for cattle feed different, DDGS used for the poultry feed, DDGS used for the fish meal. Each of the digestibility is vary from these, these different categories. And today we are working on this digestibility element of this protein, so we will have much better valorization available for a DDGS which can go for a fish meal. Despite that, we are also working upon the human protein. Now DDGS is the one, probably it is attracting almost like 30,000 rupees a ton. We have cracked the technology wherein we can also go for human protein which will be somewhere in the range of 200 rupees to 250 rupees kg and we are setting up such demo commercial scale planned in Pune and probably next six months down the line we'll also have that. So all these valorization possibilities available for giving a cross subsidized price because today we are the privileged one as a country to have a differential pricing. Tomorrow demand supply ratio might changes and differential pricing may not be there. So in that case the investor should have a good valorized product available. Brazil story has always been talked about at the various forums as a success story for the cane based ethanol plant. But I want to tell here that Brazilian, one of the company called Dedini, who are their 125-year-old company offering sugar as well as ethanol plant, have taken a collaboration from Prach to offer grain plant in Brazil. So, so the grain plant in Brazil will be definitely is developed by Prach Technology by the Dedini, a company in Brazil. India, we are actually privileged to have such a beautiful offering of a biofuel. It's not only the 1G, second generation system regulation fuel as well as the Satat program with Compressed Biogas Plan. And I would like to put this forward into the record for the G20. That today we have a success story for Brazil, but down the line after five years, maybe India can be a success story for a biofuel to world to look for that. And with this, I once again thank you everybody for this patient share. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Mule. Uh, let me just quickly summarize, open it up for questions or comments, and I know that's the only thing stopping us from having lunch, so let me just do that. Um, what's very clear from the comments made is that there's a major unlock that's gonna happen or that is possible if we leverage technology and feedstock, it's the two building blocks, but in the cradle in terms of a facilitation that comes from investments and policy, so we need uh, multiple stakeholders, multiple countries to sort of come together to make sure that we create the conditions for, for a massive uplift in terms of where we are. Uh, you know, and so whether it's financial institutions, technology providers, uh, end users, car segments, policymakers, industry associations, uh, 
you know, uh, the feedstock providers, aggregation and uh, allocation norms. I think there's a lot that needs to be uh, coming together, but I think uh, there's a lot that's also working towards it. Uh, let me stop there. Let me open it up for comments, thoughts, questions for the panel uh, from the audience. Mr. Wade. So the yield variation, uh, one can see from a maze, it's a starch element available, convertible starch element available in the maze. So today, uh, in US particularly, the convertible starch available in the, it's a very GMO-based maze. So it's available between in the range of about 72 to 74 percent. Whereas in Indian starch typically, which is ranging between 62 percent to 66 percent. So the yields available in USA are much better because it's a GMO. But normally the efficiency parameter is 92% plus efficiency which they are also achieving and we are also achieving. Uh, thank you, sir. Okay. Hi, uh, good afternoon. Uh, uh, during the, uh, the expo, uh, you know, early February, uh, there was a discussion which was happening uh, about blending ethanol to <coughs> diesel. Uh, is there any updates to that, uh, how that progress is going on? Uh, as you rightly said that uh, currently the blending is happening in gasoline, that is petrol. Yes, uh, all the oil companies, all the three oil companies are already working on how ethanol can be blended in diesel. Already pilot, uh, pilots have already been done and we have been quite successful. Only thing we need to see how to ramp it up. But uh, before I address this, before I uh, talk about this diesel, first let me give you a small uh, uh, brief about the numbers in terms of uh, ethanol availability. Currently in the country, for ethanol blending program, this year, roughly 500 crore liters of uh, ethanol is available and we are doing around 10 to 12 percent, 12 percentage blending. So that much uh, uh, ethanol is available. Going forward, when we move to E20 completely by 25, 26, we would require around 1,000 to 1,100 crore liters. So another 600 crore liter is required. For which the oil companies together, uh, you know, we have given an offtake assurance and that's how uh, design capacities of about 700 to 750 crore liters plants are going to be set up in the next couple of years. That means by end of 25-26, we are hoping to have production capacities of around 1,200 to 1,300 uh, crore liters. But then after that, what next? As uh, uh, Mr. Banerjee from CM, he pointed out that the introduction of flex fuel is also going to happen. And once our uh, pilots uh, on ethanol blending and diesel is also going to take off in a big way. So the need for ethanol is going to be even higher and higher and higher. And this is the place where uh, uh, Dr. Ram Kumar and uh, Mr. Bharatan had talked about the need for us to now move. I mean, all these uh, numbers, whatever I gave, uh, were all 1G related. So <clears throat> there is a certain limit to which we can push the existing 1G feedstocks, which is the sugar cane or the grain. But definitely we need to move now on to the other tech, uh, ways of uh, getting the ethanol, which is 2G and probably uh, 3G. That would then take care of once the blending happens uh, for diesel, because diesel is much larger. Yeah, just, just to add, uh, add to what Mr. Ravi told, that uh, there is a very active experimentation going on with the leading OEMs, heavy duty diesel OEMs uh, for blending at least 5% uh, of ethanol in, uh, in diesel. There are a lot of challenges from the automobile industry also, uh, from their viewpoint. Flashpoint uh, would come down like anything. So how to deal with that uh, reduced flashpoint? But uh, we are very glad that uh, all the leading uh, Indian uh, and multinational uh, heavy-duty diesel OEMs are part and parcel of this program. 
And to add to what Mr. Ravi said that, uh, well, biodiesel uh, we have been talking about and uh, uh, there is a 7% blending mandate uh, almost from a decade and a half, but we are not doing for lack of uh, feedstock. Of course, uh, Mr. Sandeep uh, Chaturvedi had given a different perspective to ramp up up to 100, uh, 100 crore liters. Um, from the oil marketing uh, company's viewpoint, uh, I think there is a national resolve of uh, taking it to 20% ethanol and uh, ethanol ecosystem, ethanol storage capabilities have been created and by the day they are getting added and augmented. So uh, ethanol as a formidable biofuel in all forms of fossil fuels. This is one, one way of looking at it and so that Ravi talked about uh, the demand creation. So the demand creation is now the latest kid on the block for ethanol is ethanol to jet, alcohol to jet, maybe all kinds of alcohol to jet. So they will all create that extra demand that is required and which would be a motivation for technologists to, uh, to discover more pathways for ethanol from not only the conventional feedstocks, but from various other feedstocks. One case in point is what is our collaboration with uh, Lanzatec uh, of converting from refinery of gas to ethanol. And that ethanol, using that ethanol, producing sustainable aviation fluid. We also have a collaboration with PRAS to use higher alcohols from first generation sources and then produce, it, uh, produce the sustainable aviation fluids. So ethanol al oxygenate, let's put it this way, will uh, we'll generalize the ethanol into oxygenate uh, more correctly in scientific terms. Oxygenated uh, uh, centric biofuels, uh, I think, is going to emerge in India in the years to come. One more question. Sir, it is mentioned that a FOM or LFOM uh, desired quality is confined to certain feedstock. Uh, which feedstock is appropriate? Is there any technology to achieve the desired quality? My question is to Ramkuma, sir. At least it caught the attention of one, one keen listener of my statement. <laughs> you see, for, for any FOM or LFOM to be qualified as a, as a manure, as an organic manure against the uh, existing FCO of the nation, I think uh, compositionally there are some critical parameters. One of them is nitrogen. Nitrogen is one critical parameter and not, not all biomasses will end up in producing FOM containing the requisite quantity of nitrogen. And nitrogen is a very critical parameter for any, any substance to be qualified as an organic menu. So there are certain interventions um, in on the feedstock side and also on the actual conversion process itself. Some latest microbial consortia, people are working on that, which post-production of this uh, fermented organic manure, you can, I mean, from offline of the assembly, you can treat with another set of microbial consortia to, to improve the quality of these fermented organic manures. Some such work is going on. Um, uh, for example, in my R&D center, we have developed such consortia with some good success to make an ordinary FOM to an FOM conforming to the existing FC order. And as far as feedstock is concerned, for improving the nitrogen, you need to add a particular type of uh, feedstock in whatever may be your mainstay of the feedstock. Cat dung, cattle dung or goba, whatever you can, you necessarily have to add that, some percentage. Thanks, Dr. Ramkumar. May I make one suggestion? I think we've gone over time already. I'm sure this is the, not the last statement that is going to be made on this topic. 
What's very clear from uh, the panelists and from the audience interest is, you know, there is a lot of things that need to be done around technology, policy, regulation, and making sure that we get the best in class, whether it's from industry, whether it's from policymakers, to make sure that this is really a scaled up effort in terms of uh, global biofuels alliance. Okay. With that, I want to thank the panelists for the extremely erudite thoughts and comments and very thoughtful statements that have been made from everything from the oil marketing company side to uh, the technology side. I thank the audience for the engagement and uh, let's break for lunch. <laughs>